Hi, my name is Ivan, and I will talk about Pterodactylus and cactus. That's a really hard work, but I'm pretty sure you will understand what I'm saying because this will not be something technical, something that puts a high level of, I don't know, uh, technicity to understand what I'm going to show you. Uh, to begin with, um, I'm from Brazil, and this project shows a bit of how we all makers do things. We get some topic, we get some challenge, and we face that, and we resolve that problem, and we learn by doing it. So this is a project I made with a friend, João Pedro is there, yeah. And basically, we wanted to learn AI, and we wanted to learn it with something that was at least some useful for our fun or something like that. And we made uh, something that could learn by itself how to play a game. And I mean, I, I don't like to play games, but seeing computer playing games is really nice. So basically, we wanted something that could uh, be easy to che teach and easy to analyze and easy to get information about it. So we thought, OK, why not? Uh, doing it with the dinosaur from Google. I think anyone here knows that dinosaur, right? Uh, do anyone knows that this is a game, in fact? Someone doesn't know it? <laughs> okay, then I, I made two, two people more happy today. <laughs> uh, so it's a game, all right? And the game is really, really simple. It's basically you jump and the uh, you make the dinosaur jump and skip the cactus and also avoid uh, pterodactyls. That's furthermore. This is me playing, so it's not AI yet. And the reason why we made this is really simple. It's because we wanted to learn, okay? It's because we wanted to do something and to learn by doing, not by studying uh, many things and getting a many technical words and not actually understanding deeper. So uh, who made this project? João Pedro and Tony Nagan uh, was a person that I, I don't know personally, but we were in the team that was translating TensorFlow to porting it to Node.js. And he gave that idea and I said, okay, I'll try to do that. And then the project came to life. So how did we make to, uh, how we managed to make a dinosaur learn to play the game? So the first impression that, uh, was that it would be something really difficult. But then we thought, okay, let's try to think as a robot. Let's try to think as something that we already do, which is robot. We love robotics. And so we think, let's put sensors on, on that, that dinosaur, all right? So let's create sensors, virtual sensors, that the dinosaur can understand. So the first step was to make uh, three sensors. And the first one, and the most important one for us when we are playing the game, is the distance. The distance sensor, like a ultrasonic sensor. So we may think the distance as being the distance from the dinosaur, which is always in a fixed position, to the cactus, all right? But there are more information. There is more information that we can achieve from that game. One really uh, important information is the distance. And the second most important one is the, the width of the cactus. You may think that the width may not alter the behavior of your game, but actually it does. Because if the cactus is really long, you should probably jump a little after you usually do. So you may think that it alters a bit the behavior of your plane, all right? And the third uh, information is the speed. The game with time gains speed, and with speed it increases difficulty, because you need to jump a little bit before. And in order to us uh, to understand how this is done, uh, I'll show you how it is actually implemented. So at many steps here, I put the code. I got it from the GitHub repo, and I kind of make it up it and simplified it so I could show it. I will not be able to explain all the steps, but 
uh, the presentation is online in EventMobi, so you can download it there and maybe uh, have a, a bit more insight about it. So basically, we scan the screen and we find the offset of the game because we are not reading and not injecting JavaScript code into the browser. We are reading the pixels from the computer screen. So we are basically reading you know, RGB data. And the first step is to find and locate where the game is on the screen. And that's done by um, multiple passes and finding that color and matching that uh, pattern. And after that, we have an offset point. And that offset point leads us to the starting point of, of each sensor. So basically, the sensor is offset from the origin of the game. It's always fixed. And that's basically how it works. Uh, so the next thing we thought about was we need to actuate. We need to uh, generate output from that uh, intelligence or whatever we are doing. And in order to do that, we are uh, calling it actuators. So uh, we have two actuators. One is the up key, and the other one is the down key. Yeah, the dinosaur can uh, skill. Who didn't know that? OK, so I made a few people more happy yet. So basically, uh, there are two outputs of the game. You can jump, and you can also skill. I'm not sure if that's a word. But uh, you can do that to uh, output, all right? And if we abstract that and imagine that a code, a really generic code, has inputs and outputs, you may think that in the middle of it, you would put some code, right? Here in the middle is where you code. You put ifs, you put whiles, you put something that will take information from the input and out inside it to the output. So that doesn't work in machine learning so well because machines doesn't know how to write code so well as humans. We like to write in English because we understand English, but machine doesn't need to have five letters for a while. It just needs one byte. You may think that machine can simplify things. We try to complicate it or to visualize it better and that's a way we do it in order to understand and comprehend better code. So in order to uh, achieve, a, let's say, an analog code, we cannot have really code going on. So that's the reason why exists a neural network. And a neural network is a really generic thing that connects inputs to outputs, but in different manners. So we may think that uh, instead of having code, in between it, we would have weights on each connection. And each connection can actually uh, trigger something, but not trigger as an event, trigger as a discrete event that we after process it. So for instance, if the output of one key is larger than 0 0.5, we simulate the key in the computer. So that's a discrete event being created by an analog function. So how can we actually put this into mathematic and make it possible? Uh, we may think that a neural network consists of neurons. And a neuron is basically a unit that receives input and has one output. All right? That output can also go to many places. So we can think that the same output can go to many inputs. All right? And what basically a neuron does is it aggregates inputs. So you can have any number of inputs, and you have one output for that neuron specific. So this is a really simple neural network, and this is how a uh, neuron works. Uh, you may think that it has an A and an A bigger, and this uh, is constant, 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 all right? And this A and B, uh, uh, the small ones are actually the real values coming from the, the past layer, all right? And the mathematics is, let's ponderate each input. So we basically multiply by the weight. This yellow and red are basically the weight of each input. And you sum with an x, which we call bias, 
all right? So basically, bias is a sum after all. And after calculating this line function, you go and put it on a, a sigmoid or even a logistic function and something like that in order to limit your output. You don't want it to go to infinity or negative infinity. You want it to stay there between 0 and 1 or negative 1 and 1. So you may do that. But the cool thing is, with a simple thing like that, you can create higher ordered functions and even basic ordered functions. For example, if we input 0 and 0, and the weights are 1 and 1 with bias 0, the output is 0. OK, 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 0, 0. Pretty obvious. But if we try out all the possible uh, values, uh, discrete values from 0 and 1, you will see that if we input both 1s, it goes to 2. And the truth table that is actually analog would be the same as an OR function, an OR uh, comparator. And in order to do an AND, it's basically making it harder to go up. So you basically reduce the weights from each input. So imagine that the 1 becomes a 0 0.5, and you move that bar up, and you make an AND. And you say, OK, net, let's make a, a X OR. And you cannot do it with one neuron. But you can add more neurons. You can uh, make it more complex, right? You can give it op opportunity or give it flexibility to manipulate inputs and given to become outputs. So it can become something like this. This is a XOR function. And it basically has like two limits here, all right? And well, basically, this is a neural network. Uh, and it, for me, it's really nice to see that we can generalize problems in that way, because this has three neurons. But what if we have 100 neurons, 200,000 neurons, or even millions of neurons in order to process image and detect if it's a happy cat? You know, that's something everyone likes. So, um, and a neural network becomes this, after all. You have connected inputs for, to outputs and outputs to input and so on. So imagine that we have the inputs here, which are distance, speed, and uh, width. And we have the output from the keyboard. I simplified it a bit, OK? But imagine that it can be any size. And what is cool about it is that if we remove all the connections, actually visually on your head. It doesn't actually disconnect. Oops. Uh, OK, so yeah. So this is the library I use it for uh, the neural network. It's really cool one called Synaptic. And this is the build genome uh, uh, step. And also RobotJS. Th those are the two libraries used in this project. RobotJS is really nice because it can move the pointer, click, uh, simulate key presses, and many stuff, and also read the color uh, from a lo location in the screen. Uh, so let's go. And now let's forget about the connections and just think about the neurons as being a bias, which are the bigger uh, circles, and, all, and also the weights, the small ones. So let's rebuild this. So imagine we have no connections at all, and we linearize all that data. We will have like a neuron. We will have like a genome. Sorry. So imagine that this configures, this uh, gives the ability to a neural network to work in a determinate form. So if we change values from that uh, circles, imagine each circle is like a floating point number, OK? Uh, you will alter the behavior of the neural network. And what we do now, and now we are in the, inside the genetic algorithm, algorithm, and what we do now is that we create those guys randomly. So imagine that you have the format, and you initialize uh, each uh, value with a random number. You don't actually know 
how to make the dinosaur jump cactus and win the game. There is no way to win, but I mean, be good at the game. But we actually can randomize it and create what we call a generation. So imagine that we start a generation of n elements or of n individuals, and each individual is different, okay? We randomly created them. They may not work, probably they not work, but they can be good at some, some point. So imagine that the generation is like many life forms that we will put in practice because there is no way to tell in this one is better than this one without testing them. We are putting them into practice. So what we actually do is get this, expand, put in the neural network, and play the game. We read the sensor, we apply to the neural network, we get the output, and apply to the key presses on the computer. And that basically makes the genome be alive, all right, by looping that, by con continuously uh, updating the, the key presses with the output from the neural network. And this is the first step, uh, start learning, okay? The code is all uh, really has name and methods that you can comprehend, so maybe it's nice uh, to download the, the repo. I will show the link after all. Uh, and basically we build genomes, and here we say, oh, it has three input layers, three values and one output layer, and then we execute the generation. And what execute generation does is basically it binds the sensor change value, uh, uh, a sensor change listener to the output of the keyboard, and this is actually some wrapping up stuff, but it's really simple to see it working. And after that, we can score and rank each individual, each genome, and we can say, okay, this one is better than this. Or they are all shitty genomes, but okay, this is first because there is no way to put two things uh, when you sort uh, it linearly. It cannot have two first uh, indexes. So what we do is we score them, we rank them, and we say goodbye to the not so good ones. Yeah, so I killed them in memory. I actually, garbage collector does, but uh, what matters is that they vanish from the program, and what matters most is that the best ones keep on the program. They keep running, they keep living, and this is called natural selection, but actually it's not natural, it's fully artificial but it's a form of naturally selecting individuals based on something, you know, the fitness, the probability of living, and to do that, we actually pop elements until it has n elements and before we sort them. Uh, so now we have individuals. It may be two, three, four, ten. Maybe you are running a g generation with a thousand, and what we actually do now is we have to uh, get information from them. We cannot keep uh, generating genomes randomly. That doesn't uh, get information and uh, get that, that, in, that learned information and proceed to the next generation. So we actually have to uh, get these genomes and make something that can be better. And the word can is really important because it will not for sure be better, but by joining them, by uh, crossing over them, it's important so that you can make a genome better, faster. So we cross over them and create a new genome. And after that, we have to, okay, this is the code. You can see it later. Uh, and after that, we have a genome. But imagine that in the first generation, we started all the values with zero. Imagine that all the values were zero. If you swap zero with zero, it will always be zero. Can you see it? There, will no, there is no uh, chance that the genome will get better from the values that it started. So we have to do something 
in order to allow the genome to improve or even be worse, okay? And that's called mutation. And mutation is basically a way of randomizing and select, uh, randomly selecting and randomly multiplying a value from that list, and you actually mutate each value. So you basically go, okay, Mathfont Randall is greater than 0 0.8, yeah. So this will be mutated, and you multiply it by Mathfont Randall times two, minus one. Okay, so basically we have a new genome, and we have to complete the generation. We have to fill, in, fill out the generation again. And what we do now, uh, this is the mutate data keys. It actually takes a, a key from a collection, and it mutates by uh, applying random values to it in a random manner. It's really random, yeah. So after that, we complete the generation and we create another genomes based on the selected ones. And after that, we have a fully new generation, a generation that can be tested again, that can be uh, scored again, and that can be sorted again, and that can be selected again, and then that can be mutated, and all the process again. And the cool thing is, when does it work? When I know it's ready, you know, for production, I mean, uh, let's produce uh, dinosaurs. No, but that's the cool part. That's the part I, I most like about the genetic algorithm. It can always be improved, but it's always limited to the input data you put and also to the speed, to the processing speed. In this case, the computer uh, reading pixels takes too long and makes the algorithm a little bit slow, like 50, 40 milliseconds, and the ideal would be like 15 milliseconds to reach at least 60 frames per second. So i show a little demo now. Uh, you can download and run node index. You put the terminal aside from the Google Chrome, and it must be offline, of course, but there is a tricky, I, I found out you can uh, simulate offline connection with Google Chrome, so that's useful. Uh, and then you run the program, you see that the mouse will go to the, okay, you are not seeing because it's, thank you for letting me know. Okay, now I think you should see, yeah. So this is the game, mm. and this is the terminal. And this is me trying to fit both of them in the screen. <laughs> okay, so they both fitted. Uh, and the first step the, the program does is find out where the game is. And you can see the mouse will move to the, I didn't execute the program. So you see the mouse is on the offset position, exactly on the left of the dinosaur. I can move it later, okay. Oh, something that caused me trouble is that when I started doing programs with RoboJS, it moves the mouse. And then I say, okay, let's test the move mouse function. And then I made a loop that moved the mouse to a position and click it. And I had to reset my computer because I couldn't control C, the terminal, because it was focusing on the <laughs> on point, a random point all the time. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, so basically, I will play the game here myself. You can see there are three bars, and I'm really bad at this game. I think that's the reason I made a, this, this project. Uh, but the first one is the distance. The second one is the size and the third one is the speed. And the fourth one is the activation. And the activation was the version one that I shipped. Uh, if the value from activation goes above 0 0.55, it simulates the up key. If it goes below 0 0.45, it simulates the down key. And in the middle of that, it just releases the key, all right? So we can think that the fourth bar is the uh, actuator. Okay, 
that output from our neural network. So we are putting three, three, three values and getting this. So this is how I started uh, after coding. And this is really bad for debugging because this is not something you expect. This is, he, he's already playing it. Uh, and he's, he's starting from scratch to learn. So you can see that he built genomes. He built 12 genomes. And he's testing the genome 4 of 12, 5 of 12. And he's reading the game state from the, with color from the screen. So he knows when the game ends by reading the game over. And also, it does it uh, consecutively. And after we reach out uh, the uh, 12 genome, it will generate a new generation select the best ones, and keep going. So after three hours, or four, <laughs> yeah, uh, a thing happened. And I, I made a function to speed that up by actually checking if the genome is at least not dumb enough. And I can label it with a true here, which is the flag should check experience, okay. So that's pretty direct. But what it actually does it, is it takes the, the own network and it tests many inputs and check if the output uh, at least gives me two state possibles for the keys. Up and down, not, nothing and down, nothing and up, down and up, I, I, I don't care. I just check if there are two. Because if there is only one, we know he will die. Even if he keeps jumping, he will die. And that's not a good uh, genome. So if we try it out again, you see that generation is in the fourth generation. And maybe something is useful. No. <laughs> uh, and that's basically uh, the process in a, in a faster uh, way, all right? I didn't want to, uh, we, we didn't want to uh, change a lot of things because, and check before, because that would imply that we know the better solution, the best solution. And we actually don't. And we learned that from a generation that I call Ninja. So, let me f kill him, okay? So he's that. I can load ninja generation and start. He keeps down. And you may think, all right, that's, that's dumb, right? But actually, no. After we got to that generation that keeps down all the time, we saw that keeping down is the better solution for the game. Because when you press down, you like increase gravity, and the dinosaur uh, goes faster to the ground. And also, the pterodactyls, they are up, and he can't see them. So if he is always down, he will skip the pterodactyls. So from pterodactyls and cactus uh, to artificial intelligence, this was the project. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>
Yeah, so that's basically life. You know, if there isn't random plus random, which gives random, then there wouldn't be life because there wouldn't be a random thing to initiate something. So uh, I pick it up a uh, few values and I tested them. I couldn't plot graph because it would take time and I tried it on the airplane but my battery ran out. So uh, basically mutation rate is like 0 0.2 and the crossover is random, completely random. There is no uh, ponderation there. But we picked up values that I checked on the internet and I saw that they were okay, that's 20%. I'm not sure how, what's the actual value for life, but it should be around uh, less than 5%, I guess. Otherwise, there would be a lot of problem, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, anyone else? So, yeah. What's the high score? The, the high score, okay. So yeah, he beat it me and my friend uh, and all my friends as well. I will try, oh, I cannot access here. It's offline, but here it's online. So the video is basically a version of what I said today. My channel has a few videos uh, about PID and algorithms for robots and also uh, there are a few other projects that I made with Node.js, like controlling ABB robot with Node.js. That's a cool one, yeah. So there is the video here. It has English subtitles. And at the end, it plays the game. And here is he learning. I had to film that from an outside camera because recording the screen takes too much CPU and that reduced the amount of time we have to compute the game and actuate. But at the end, let's see. Oh, YouTube. I think it's 1,932. 2,000, yeah, 2,932, I guess. So this is him. Can you note that when he goes down, it's faster to reach the bottom? That's... Yeah, he died. So 2,532, so that's the maximum. If you want, you can improve the algorithm and you know, just give a pull request and our dinosaur will be better in the future. <laughs> so anyone else? I guess that's it. Thank you very much.